Hi, good morning. Um, so today we are joined by the lovely Sandra, who's a data scientist at LIST. Thank you so much for joining us, Thank Sandra. Thank you for having me. Um, so we just wanted to talk about um, women in technology and give them a voice. And today Sandra will be the first person to be taking part in our video blogs. Um, so Sandra, I just kind of wanted to ask you first. So you were featured in Stylist magazine recently. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So I um, was featured during uh, the Fashion Week edition, uh, not so long ago, about three weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, it was really exciting. It was actually like such a fun experience. Um, I remember the day they actually sent, like the RPR manager at List sent me an email uh, to tell me that I was, you know, the stylist contacted them to feature me in it. And um, it was really cool and I, I usually, pick up stylist so I thought oh this is really exciting and then um, and yeah doing it was was a lot of fun and and I, I really really loved the response that I got from it so oh, I'm really happy great. about what it. Was the, what was the response like? Um, so I think the most the best part about it was a lot of women contacted me through Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, the various ways they could get through to me but a lot of them were just um, contacting me to basically tell me all about how they were really impressed and that they didn't know women were like you know doing this on a daily basis and um, it actually got me really involved in a lot of um, women in tech yeah. sort of events like that's how we met yeah. and um, yeah but like just going out there and being able to tell people what um, what you can do with your skills has been like such a great uh, like way to, to actually do it. And so when we previously met, you actually told me that um, so many women, or at least quite a few women, actually work in technology at LIST. Yeah. Um, now, I'm, I know from my three years of recruitment that that's actually quite rare, especially for tech startups as well. Yeah. What do you think LIST is doing that many companies aren't? Well, I, I think what helps LIST a lot is the fact that it's, it's a fashion product at the end of the day, so it's quite attractive for women. Mm. Um, I, I say we've got like more women than other companies, like we're about 20% women engineers at list, uh, but in terms of a whole company we're about 50-50, so you do find the balance somewhere else in the company actually, yeah. so it's, it, it's, it's quite a nice mix, um, but yeah, I think, I think what helps a lot is the fact that it's attractive to women, you know, knowing that you're, you're going to be developing all day, but working for a product that you, you're personally interested in, which is fashion, mm -hmm. I think is a, is a great advantage List has. But I'm, I'm, I don't want to sit here and pretend like we're actively trying to hire more women developer. Like okay. it, at the end of the day, we actually get more male applicants, but, and, and we hire the right person for the role. It's yeah. just about, um, we probably get more applications Traction from women. From women. Yeah. yeah, okay. In, in the startup world, which is a good thing. Yeah, no, it's a really good thing. I think most companies would probably envy you. For yeah, that, yeah, so yeah. Good. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> so as part of List, you also took part in the I look like an engineer campaign, which yeah. was a hashtag that went viral on Twitter. Do yeah. you want to tell us a little bit more about that campaign? The, the idea behind it was that uh, not many people knew that women that you had software engineers that were women and, and that also most software engineers nowadays just look like anyone else. People have a very stereotypical image and I'd say a negative one actually of, of engineers in general. And I think that it's, um, that hashtag really, I'm so glad it went viral because it really helped yeah. like basically show the world that we look normal, we, we can be anyone and, and that you know we, we work like everyone else. And um, so it started off with, a bunch of women and as soon as we picked it up, like we saw that it went viral, we, um, uh, one of the engineers in, at List who runs our blog decided, oh, let's, let's make the most of this campaign and actually write a blog post about what every single woman engineer does at List. Yeah. And so we did it and it, overnight we just m managed to turn it around really quickly and that was, that's how we, we did it. But I'm so glad we actually managed to get it out as well because um, we have quite a few women and we all do, we all work on different things yeah. and different parts of the business. So it, it was um, a great yeah. opportunity for us as well. That's amazing as well yeah. that List decided to take part in that campaign as well, I guess, because yeah. that will also tr attract more women yes, because they're obviously. speaking out about the women that they have. Yeah. Also, it's, it's amazing because that campaign shows that you don't 
like you said, have to look a certain way or mm. dress a certain way. Um, I pick up the stylist all the time, and when I came across the article, I actually loved it. Not only because you're a data scientist, and that's mainly one of the areas that I cover through my work, but also because you were talking about your love of shoes and yes. your love of fashion <laughs> in the article, and it just made it really personal, I think. It just made it seem like, um, you know, you don't have to be disinterested in fashion or act a certain way or behave a certain way to be in, or look a certain way to be an engineer, so that's yeah. great. My other question, which was slightly not related to your job, but just kind of more, I just wanted to know what your favorite pair of shoes is at the moment. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of them, um, and okay. So basically, the ones I love the most at the moment are those high top trainers I got um, last summer. They're Philip Lim. Yeah. They're by Philip Lim, and they're called the Morgan high tops. And okay. they're the ones that actually I get the most compliments <laughs> for when I wear them. Whenever I wear them, someone's just like, "Oh, I like your trainers. Where are they from?" Before you joined List, yeah. um, you had just completed your PhD, and you also did your undergrad in physics. Is yeah. that right? Yes. <laughs> just kind of wanted to know, why physics? <laughs> um, so when I was 16, we, uh, my physics teacher at school organized a trip to the desert. Um, I, I grew up in Doha. And um, it was a trip just to observe the sky, to see the stars, the planets, and the moon and stuff. And I was probably the only student that was interested in everything that was going on. <laughs> Obviously, everyone just wanted to start on the barbecue and everything. And I was just there, really amazed by everything that was happening. Um, and that's when I realized, oh, I'm, I'm actually really interested in, in astronomy and astrophysics in general and physics. And I, I, I always loved sciences. And um, my dad uh, wanted me to become an, uh, a doctor or an engineer because that's what most Egyptian fathers want. <laughs> um, and I, like, I, they didn't seem that interesting to me for just personal reasons, I guess. And, so I thought, well, how, how else am I going to get into this whole astronomy business? Yeah. Um, and I realized that in to, to get to astrophysics, you had to study physics first. Um, and I made my dad believe that to get to engineering, you had to study physics first. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I did my undergrad in physics. <laughs> and then mm. I, I took a course in, in astronomy during my undergrad. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then applied for my postgrad at Warwick uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. and and got to do my master's there and I really enjoyed it as well so I just carried on and did a PhD in it as well in, in astrophysics Amazing. that's how that's how it all came about so I guess after physics anyway and astronomy you ended up in tech yes <laughs> did you on some level know that you were going to end up going down that path or Absolutely do you want to tell us no how you kind idea. of got into I it I had no idea I wanted I, I was going to end up in tech I didn't even know that was something I could do actually after my PhD um, so I finished my PhD back in um, around September 2014, and um, I, d I, I knew I didn't want to stay in academia, so, but then I didn't know what I could do with my skills, and that was the tough part for me, I think. Um, from my understanding, I knew I could get into banking, which is what everyone told me. Everyone was like, well, if you don't end up in academia, and you, you know you did physics, investment banks are just going to take you don't worry yeah. <laughs> and but that worried me because I didn't I never was really interested in finance um, so that was that was like a, a period where I thought oh you know this is this is not gonna be fun <laughs> <basically>. <laughs> and um, and yeah and then I came across data science uh, as I was like you know brushing up my LinkedIn account and stuff and, yeah. and looking for jobs and I read up about it and attended a few meetups and I realized that oh this is really interesting this is something that I can transfer my skills into without and, and it's still slightly related to what I did in terms of like working with data and analyzing it, but also building models and stuff. Yeah. So I thought, well, this is, this is great. Let me, let me go down that route instead. And, and then list came along and that's how I ended up in tech. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite coding language? Um, so I did, I, I learned Python during my PhD. Mm -hmm. Like actually starting from my masters, I used Python. And that's what helped me get a job in, in industry. Um, and we mostly use Python at LIST, so I'd say Python is my favorite coding language just because I found it the most um, natural one to learn. Mm -hmm. um, during my undergrad, I did some C and Fortran. Like, I took a couple of C and Fortran courses, and I personally did not enjoy them at all. So yeah. I think, um, I think it's, it's good that I came across Python because 
um, it changed my idea of actually coding and, and yeah. developing and everything. Like so, okay. I'm definitely a Python, <laughs> <laughs> a Python lover. That's so the other question I was going to bring up and actually um, talk to you about is obviously you mentioned before that you know your dad's Egyptian. Yeah. I'm also of Middle Eastern heritage and. I think you probably share the same frustrations I do sometimes when people have certain misconceptions and certain perceptions, I guess, of women in the Middle East. They don't often view them as career minded. Yeah. Um, I just wondered kind of what, you know, what would you say to those people who think that? I mean, it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough topic in a way because um, you have people see, see the Middle East in a certain way, but they've never actually been there, they haven't you know, lived there. And, and I grew up in a house where my mom was super hardworking, um, really successful banker, and so I saw that as you know, a woman who can be successful. I never saw my mom as, as a housewife. I mean, no offense to housewives, I think it's the hardest thing as well. Like, yeah. it's just, um, you know, women, uh, a lot of women do it out of choice in the Middle East. It's not something they're forced to do at exactly. all. Like they, they choose to look after their homes, their husbands, their children. And I completely respect that. I think it's amazing. But I, I know I probably don't have the patience for that. <laughs> and, and so, um, and seeing the way my mom ended up pretty successful, I just thought like, oh, she's a great role model. I want to do the same. Yeah. Um, and all I can say is that when, when what I see is like when women choose to, um, to, to go down the career path and actually focus on their careers and their jobs, they're really hard working and that's mm -hmm. something that um, amazes me a lot because they see their parents as very hard working people yeah. and they just follow the same steps in a way and yeah. um, they, they won't settle basically. If they choose yeah. to go down the career <laughs> path, they're not going to settle anywhere. They're just going to keep working hard and hard and until they get to where they want to get. Not meaning to stereotype, but Arab <laughs> women are meant to be quite ruthless. So. Yes. <laughs> I do agree so, with that. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's, it's, in a way, it's, it's a shame that people see it that way, but yeah. um, they shouldn't forget that there are many, many women out there that are not necessarily that, that kind. Like, yeah. I guess it's the same everywhere, right? Yeah. You have some women that choose to bring up a family and that's yeah. also very rewarding. And then you have some women who just want to concentrate on their career and yeah. that's really rewarding yeah. for them. And then you have people who do both. So exactly. it's kind of up to us and what we want to do with yeah. our lives and it's the same everywhere. Um, the other thing that I was going to mention actually is sadly because of a lot of what's going on in the Middle East, um, and what has been going on for a long time, a lot of women don't often get access yeah. to education or to job opportunities anywhere, never mind just specifically in tech. Yeah. So I just wondered kind of, because I know that's something you're very passionate about and I was just wondering if yes. you know, that's something you wanted to do something about and what your plans are. Yeah, so it's obviously tough being here and wanting to support women in the Middle East at the same time. Like I find that you know, to actually do make a really big difference, you, mm -hmm. you have to go out there. Um, like, I actively support charities in Egypt that mm -hmm. I know are focused on educating girls. And, I mean, 80% of the population is illiterate. Like, we yeah. have a huge problem in Egypt. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of them are young. So, yeah. the idea is I'm trying to find chat like, people that are there and that are already actively working on educating girls up to the age of 18 and you know making sure they get to university yeah. and and get an education that way it, it hurts when I go back there and I see the way you know the kids are, are not getting the education they deserve and yeah. it's the only way they're, they're they are eventually going to get jobs anyway yeah it's so. cool I wish you all the best of luck with the charity Thank stuff and um, that would be amazing to do um, the other thing that I wanted to ask since you're now living in London yeah. and you did your undergrad in Paris, yes. just wondered what your favourite thing was to do in Paris and what your favourite thing to do in London Ooh. is now. <laughs> <laughs> I think in both cases, I just love to eat out, which is really <laughs> bad. I have this like obsession with eating out. And um, so, yeah, I mean, if it, it, as long as it involves like a, a relaxed atmosphere, I'm yeah. usually a happy person. <laughs> we talked about it before, yeah. didn't we? The yeah. whole brunch thing. <laughs> we're, both, we're both clearly obsessed with brunch. Yeah, we are. What's your, 
What, where's your next place that you have in Renshaw? Um, so there's this little Greek tapas place mm -hmm. uh, called Opso. Okay. Um, that's been on my list for like a few months now, and I think that's the next one I really want to go to. So okay, we should we should cool. set a date. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Let's do that. All right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. For um, your time, Sandra, and it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Jasmine. No problem. Thanks.